title for today's session is Ritual Mysticism and Abraham uh, Maimouni. But this isn't just, uh, hold on, slideshow. There we go. But this isn't just the fourth session. This is the final session. And the final session wraps up the entire four, four classes. And so another name that would not have been the most attractive or the best marketing tool um, to name this whole series would be Moses Maimonides, Judaism's greatest loser. Now, greatest can be understood in several different ways, I hope you understand. Um, and so by the end of today's session, I think you will see why he's the greatest and why he's the greatest loser. So I have mentioned this before, but I wanted to show it to you as we say from the inside. So this is in the last of the three books of the Guide of the Perplexed, right? Three books in uh, between two covers, or usually um, the modern versions are in two volumes. So it's uh, three books within uh, four covers, but toward um, really right in the middle of the final book, we're introduced to Rambam's understanding of the nature of ritual, God's wisdom and wily graciousness. Okay, so wisdom and wily graciousness is how the Arabic of a noble lie gets translated, okay? So we're back to that political idea of, we're gonna lie, but it's for a good reason, okay? God's wisdom and wily graciousness as shown in the gradual succession of the various states. That's the key here, okay? of the whole individual will become clear to you. He gives one example, but another example is the manner in which God provided for each individual animal of the class of mammalia. When such an animal is born, it is extremely tender and can't be fed with dry food. Therefore, breasts were provided which yield milk, and the young can be fed with moist food which corresponds to the condition of the limbs of the animal until the latter have gradually, again, that's the key, gradually become dry and hard. These are Aristotelian terms, right? Wet and dry and hard and soft. Okay, so on, a, on an anatomical level, on a physical level, on a corporeal level, we have the example of God's wisdom and wily graciousness slowly, successfully graduating from soft, wet to dry, hard. Many precepts in our law and the Torah are the result of a similar course adopted by the Supreme Being. Why? Because it's impossible to suddenly go from one extreme to the other. That's the key. Impossible to go suddenly from one extreme to the other. It's therefore, according to the nature of humanity, impossible for him suddenly to discontinue everything to which he has been accustomed. Now, God sent Rabbi, Moses to- Sorry, I'm stopping you for a technical issue. We need to switch host and co-host so I can see what people are writing. And because of our earlier drama, it got mixed up. So um, if you can just do that with me for a moment. Sorry about that, everyone. Perfect. Done. Sorry. Thank you. Um, now, God sent Moses to make the Israelites a kingdom of priests and a holy nations by means of the knowledge of God. So I'm just reminding everybody that what the high point of human life is all about is knowledge, not action, but knowledge. And when we say knowledge of God, we're not talking in Maimonides about knowledge of God's essence, because that is transcendent. That is beyond anything that we can imagine. 
but knowledge of God's actions in the world. And how do you learn about that? How do you love God and know God? By studying Aristotle's physics and metaphysics. And that's what we talked about in the first class. The Israelites were commanded to devote themselves to God's service. Okay, service, I'm reminding people, is avodah, worship. Serve God with all your heart. Serve the Lord your God. You shall serve him. But here's the, here's the thing. The custom, which was in those days general, I would say universal among all men, and the general mode of worship in which the Israelites were brought up in that heathen land of Egypt, consisted in sacrificing animals in those temples which contained idols and to bow down to those idols and to burn incense before those Id idols. Religious and ascetic persons were in those days, the persons that were devoted to the worship, to the service in the temples, erected to the stars, as has been explained by us. It was in accordance with the wisdom here, the wily graciousness and plan of God as displayed in the whole creation, just like with the mammal example that we started the chapter with, that God did not command us to give up and stop all this manner of service, all this worship that was characteristic of idolatry. For to obey such a commandment would have been contrary to the nature of man who generally cleaves to that which he is used to. It would in those days, and here he slips something in that's very interesting, folks. It would in those days have made the same impression as a prophet would make today. Of course, today is 1190, but I think 2022, same thing. It would in those days have made the same impression as a prophet would make at present if he called us to the service of God and told us in God's name, because that's what prophets do, that we should not pray to him. We should not fast. We should not seek God's help in time of trouble, right? Like Nachshon, move yourself into a place of your own salvation. What should we do? We should serve God in thought and not by any action. That's Rambam's ideal, as we will see. For this reason, God allowed these kinds of worship practices conti to continue. What he did was he just changed the address. So instead of doing the idolatrous practices to an idol, we did those same practices to God. He transferred to his service that which had formerly served as a worship of created beings and of those things imaginary and unreal and commanded us to serve God in the same manner, that is to build him a temple. Okay, and now we're going to get one more example. By this divine plan, uh, by this divine plan, it was effected that the traces of idolatry were blotted out. And the truly great principle of our faith, which is worth making all kinds of other noble lies in order to hammer home, the existence and unity of God was firmly established. This result was obtained without deterring or confusing the minds of the people who were used to this idolatrous practice in Egypt by the abolition of the service to which they had become accustomed and was familiar to them. Now. Maimonides is speaking like a rabbi. I know that at first thought, you're going to reject this idea and find it strange. You'll put the following question to me in your heart, in your mind. How can we even imagine that the meets vote and the prohibitions and the fasts and all those things that like make up the 611 meets vote that don't have to do with the Lord your God and not bowing down to I idols? How can we suppose that all those things, which are fully explained and for which certain ser seasons are fixed, should not have been commanded for their own sake, for their own intrinsic merit, but only for the sake of some other thing? As if 
they were only the means which God employed for God's primary object, which was the unity and exist, the existence and the unity of God. The question is, what prevented God from making his primary object a direct commandment to us and to give us the capacity of obeying it? Those precepts, which in your opinion are only the means and not the object, would then have been unnecessary. He's not going to answer that question. And by not answering that question, he's answering that question. But he is going to show you an example from the Torah by way of saying that's not how God works. Hear my answer, which will cure your heart of this disease and will show you the truth of that which I've pointed out to you. There occurs in the Torah a passage which contains exactly the same idea. Here it is. God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure, I think peradventure means maybe, perhaps, the people repent when they see war, meaning the people will freak out and will lose courage when they see war, and they'll go back to Egypt. Therefore, God led the people about circuitously through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. Here, God led the people about, roundabout, away from the direct road which God originally intended because God feared that they might meet on that way with hardships too great for their ordinary strength. He took them by another road in order to obtain thereby his original object. In the same manner, God refrained from prescribing, ah, here we go, in the same manner, God refrained from prescribing what the people by their natural disposition would be incapable of obeying. Silent meditation, worship, by thinking and meditating and contemplating on the existence and unity of God and God's actions in the world. God refrained from doing that and gave the above mentioned commandments as a means of securing his chief object, that is to spread a knowledge of him among the people and to cause them to reject idolatry. Okay. The only thing I wanna say before we take our first round of questions is that when the Israelites start going roundabout and they follow God's directions, you know what Pharaoh says about them? That they must be perplexed. They must have had the desert disorient them, and so they are perplexed. And that is the only reference to perplexed that we have in the guide of the perplexed. Okay, Shadel, questions? Yes, a few. Uh, first one is, uh, how does he relate to miracles in like, uh, if all of the things are just for another thing? Yeah, so God does not change the course of nature, right? The world goes according to its custom. Maimonides says that over and over again, and anything that looks to be different, you have to understand figuratively. So there are no miracles. They're just figurative. If what you mean by a miracle is a suspension of natural law, a suspension of physics, that does not happen. But things can be miraculous, and we can call miracles you know, that was great timing. Timing is everything. That was, you know, a miraculous discovery. You can use the word miracle in different ways, but Maimonides will not allow there to be anything that is a violation of natural law, the laws of nature. Um, you said that by not answering, uh, he answers the question. So could you explain that a little and why does he not answer it directly? Yeah. So, you know, he's, the, the, the question that he's posing is why couldn't God have, you know, made us in such a way that we could spin on a dime and move from one opinion to its opposite immediately? Well, 
he never answers that question, but the answer to the question is, you know, I don't know if the answer to the question is, but God didn't make us like that. And the fact that God didn't make us like that is exemplified by the fact that God knows how we're made, and that's why God didn't have us go the most direct route to the land of Israel, because he knew that the slaves would not have had the courage and would not have had the military preparation and would not have had the faith to combat other people who challenged them along the way. So could God have made us with a different psychology? Maimonides would want to say yes, because he wouldn't want to upset anybody, but he didn't. We are made the way we are made, and psychologically, it is impossible for a human being to go from one extreme to the other immediately. That's why he began with the idea of a baby gradually in successive stages becoming accustomed to more mature nourishment. Let me, let me repeat that being accustomed to more mature nourishment. And that's what Maimonides is giving you in the Guide of the Perplexed. He's trying to slowly bring people up to speed on a more mature form of religiosity. Okay, before I move to another question, there are quite a few uh, miracle questions popping up from the Hanukkah oil to the parting of the Red Sea uh, that was not natural and like how can it be explained or is it then just going back to the figurative speech, like how? Yeah, so, you know, Hanukkah is post-biblical, so that's already kind of easy to answer. The parting of the Red Sea is a little more challenging, um, but it's only more challenging if you're not relying upon a figurative understanding of the Torah as religious literature. But Maimonides is telling you, understand the Torah figuratively. That's the only way to be wise. Remember I showed you that three-part distinction, right? You can, you can read the Torah literally and understand it's true. That's pathetic. You can read the Torah literally and reject it because it makes no sense. That's even worse than pathetic. Or you can, uh, you can read the Torah figuratively, and that's what the wise people do. But the only way, and I want to emphasize this, the only way in which you know to read the Torah figuratively is if you've understood the science so that what the Torah is describing is against nature on a literal read. If, the, if what the Torah is saying violates the laws of nature literally, then by Maimonides' definition, you got to read it figuratively. But it's through science that we know how to read the Torah. So for Maimonides, for instance, right, you've got these four elements, air, earth, fire, and water. Maimonides reads those four elements into the first two verses of Genesis, air, earth, fire, and water. Oh, but wait a second. There is no fire. There is no fire in those first two verses, but Maimonides knows, knows from Aristotle that there must be fire. So all the way over in Deuteronomy, there's a verse that talks about the darkness of fire. And so, oh, if fire is connected to darkness and we have darkness in the first verses of Genesis, then there's our fire. So we've got the four Aristotelian elements, QED, okay? But you have to know, I want to emphasize this. You're working, Maimonides is working backwards. You know Aristotle and you shoehorn Aristotle into the Torah. Should have. A um, couple more. Uh, did he write, like, who did he write the guide for the perplexed for? Is it the general public or is it some imaginary excellent student or someone specific? Well, it is someone specific. It is um, a student with whom he began learning and that student had to leave. So at the very beginning of the guide, he writes a letter to this student saying, we didn't get a chance to finish. So I'm sending you these 
Um, if you have any questions, you know, get back to me. But this is the conclusion of our course of study together. And he says in the introduction that he's writing this for the one in 10,000 who is ready to take that next graduated successive step to a more mature form of religious nourishment. Okay, and one last one for this one. Um, if his uh, ideas that ideally we'd worship God through thought, what is his vision for the Jewish people? Like, to would we reach that goal? Does he talk about uh, reaching there and the future of Judaism? That's a great segue back to our text. <laughs> okay. So, because now... Right, we're talking about that knowledge that people have, intellectual mysticism. So I have mentioned and not really um, explained the, mm, the Sufi background of some of the Jewish writers. The most famous Jewish Sufi, ah, what's Sufism? Sufism is Islamic mysticism. Okay, whirling dervishes are Sufi masters. In northern Spain, in Zaragoza, there was an amazing thinker and judge named Bachia. And Bachia Ibn Bakuda wrote a book called Duties of the Heart. Mm -hmm. Up until that point, folks, Jews didn't know about duties from the heart. We just knew about duties of the limbs right? But he basically is translating a Sufi pietistic manual. In He's not translating it into Hebrew. He still wrote in Arabic, but he's translating it into native Jewish and rabbinic language in order to help promote piety amongst the Jews of 12th century northern Spain. In the last four chapters of the Guide of the Perplexed. So guide in the in book three of the guide, chapters 51, 52, 53, and 54. Those are the last four chapters. Maimonides is doing the same thing, trying to explain what the goal of humanity looks like with a twist. Okay, so now let's read and then we'll twist. When you have succeeded in properly performing these acts of divine service and you have your thought during their performance entirely abstracted from worldly affairs, withdrawn from worldly affairs, then take care that your thought be not disturbed by thinking of what you want for lunch or of what you need to do when you get back home or of what your wife asked you to, your partner asked you to pick up at the grocery store. In short, think of worldly matters when you eat, drink, bathe, talk with your wife and little children, or when you converse with other people. These times, which are plenty frequent and plenty long, must suffice to you for reflecting on everything that's necessary as regards business, household, and health. But when you're engaged in the performance of mitzvot, have your mind exclusively directed to what you are doing. When we have acquired a true knowledge of God and rejoice in that knowledge in such a manner that when speaking with others or attending to our bodily needs, our mind is still all the time with God, when we are with our heart constantly near God, heart and mind are the same organ. That's true. When, when Rambam says heart, he's talking about intellect. He's talking about your mind. When we are with our heart constantly near God, even when our body is in the society and company of men, when we are in that state, which the Song of Songs on the relationship between God and humanity poetically describes, figuratively describes in the following words, I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved that knocks, right? My beloved is God, and we're sleeping in this world, taking care of our physical needs, doing things that are not so important. What wakes us up is God's wisdom as understood 
through our knowledge of nature and creation. When we get to that point, when we can, while engaging with other people doing mundane business and still have our minds in a contemplative state, then we have attained not only the height of ordinary prophets, but of Moses, our teacher, of whom scripture states, and Moses alone shall come near before the Lord. When it says, and Moses alone shall come near before the Lord, everybody, that's talking about Mount Sinai. It's talking about physical proximity. But God doesn't have a body. God is incorporeal. So if God is incorporeal, then you have to read this figuratively. And so what's it talking about? Coming near intellectually, not geographically, not cartographically, right? There's no GPS, even ways, not even ways is going to get you to God. You know the difference between these two Hebrew terms that signify to love, ahav and cheshek? When a man's love is so intense that his thought is exclusively engaged with the object of his love, it's expressed by the Hebrew term cheshek, cheshek. The philosophers have already explained that bodily forces of a man in his youth, his hormones, prevent the development of moral principles. Right? Philosophers have already told you that. Because by the time you get to our age, we may have forgotten. In a greater measure, this is the case as regards the purity of thought, which man attains through the perfection of those ideas that lead him to an intense love of God. I'm not sure that was right. I feel like I missed a negative there somewhere. Okay, well, you'll see where this is going. Man can by no means attain this intense love of God so long as his bodily humors are hot, right? Aristotelian language here. It's actually from Galen. The more the forces of his body are weakened, in other words, the older he gets, and the fire of passion quenched, in that same measure does man's intellect increase in strength and light. His knowledge becomes pure, and he's happy with his knowledge. When this perfect man is stricken in age and is near death, then his knowledge mightily increases. His joy in that knowledge grows greater, and his love for the object of his knowledge more intense. And it is in this great delight that the soul separates from the body. This is the state that our sages referred to when they were talking about the death of Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, because they said in those three cases, and in those three cases alone, that they died by a kiss. So we learn from the words in Deuteronomy, and Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab by the mouth of the Lord. Al pi Adonai, the pshat, the plain contextual sense, is by God's command, but the rabbis say that it was a kiss right, by the mouth of God, the kiss of death, but not in a negative way, in the most positive way imaginable. Un coming to understand, having that proximity, not geographically, but intellectually with God at the very end. The meaning of this saying is that these three died in the midst of the pleasure derived from the knowledge of God and their great love for him. When our sages figuratively call the knowledge of God, you, uh, when our sages figuratively call the knowledge of God united with intense love for him a kiss, they follow the well-known poetical diction from Song of Songs, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. This kind of death, which in truth is deliverance from death, has been ascribed by our sages to none but those three. For Maimonides, it is knowledge that is your eternal reward. Knowledge never expires. Knowledge, true knowledge, lives forever. This life, when we don't have true knowledge, this life is death. But when we die, whatever degree to which we have understood 
and come with true knowledge of God and God's actions, that is Olam Haba for Maimonides. That is the world to come for Maimonides, right? Truth is deliverance from death. Okay. That's the end of Maimonides. Now we're going to get the, the twist, okay? David Blumenthal at Emory points out, Maimonides uses all this Sufi and Islamic mystical language, such as bliss and union and passionate love and total devotion, closeness. He uses entire phrases taken from Sufi literature. People read David Blumenthal to think, oh, so Maimonides is Sufi. And that after all of that intellectual stuff, he's really talking about this kind of mystical union with God. There was always pushback to Blumenthal. But we didn't have Jews doing comparative Islamic Jewish medieval philosophy at the same level that we do now until relatively recently. So last year, Diana Lobel came out with that book, Moses and Abraham Maimonides. And what she points out is that what he's done in 351, which is the chapter we were reading, is to intellectualize the Sufi terminology, emphasizing that it is intellect, not love as an emotion, that is the bond of connection, the bond through which one attains closeness to God and passionate love for the divine is the intellect. Okay, I'm checking the time, seeing if we should take, uh, I'm, let's take a few more questions now, and then we'll get back to the, fin to the finish line. Okay, so some questions are going more towards the content and some towards the acceptance of Rambam even nowadays. So I'll start with the content stuff and tell me if you want. Yeah, I'm that. not going to talk about acceptance right now because that's the end. Okay, so uh, one question, is um, this death by kiss attained by Moses, Aaron, and Miriam possible only for them, or is it something that someone could attain or aspire to? Well, theoretically, we, can, we, theoretically, we should all strive for it. But Maimonides is saying that that in the Bible, in our religious literature, that level of prophecy, that level of contemplative knowledge of God's actions was reserved for those three people alone. But we should absolutely strive for it. I, I do want to point out that Miriam is in there, right? He didn't have to include Miriam because it doesn't say that Miriam died by the kiss of, by the mouth of God. The rabbis say that she did, but the Torah didn't want to say that because it's kind of salacious right? Ew, God's a boy and he's kissing Miriam and she's, ew. So the rabbis say, you know, the, the Torah is using um, Saginahor. It's using kind of euphemistic language, but Miriam had the same awesome death as her brothers. Um, another question, when Rambam refers to knowledge, um, how is this related to the tree of knowledge and the Garden of Eden? Um, and like, is it going back there? Uh, absolutely it is. Okay, so there is a whole chapter written on this. Shirel, you should write this down. So the name of the author is Marvin Fox. Marvin Fox taught at Brandeis, and when he retired, it was Art Green who took over for him, and Art Green was my uh, PhD advisor at Brandeis. So Marvin Fox has a book called Interpreting Maimonides, and he does a... Um, an expansive analysis of book one, chapter two, which is the Garden of Eden analysis. And so knowledge and matter figure prominently. Knowledge and matter, the way Aristotle understands form and matter, figure prominently. So the answer is absolutely yes, them, they are connected. Um, and Maimonides does you know, I think an excellent job as an exegete, as a biblical commentator, linking these different kinds of ideas throughout the Bible. So uh, the book is called Interpreting Maimonides. It's not only for scholars. Um, he's got a lot of really wonderful essays. And amongst the best in that book is the chapter on um, Guide, book one, chapter two. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely include that uh, in the notes. 
Um, let me just see. Um, yeah, in terms, you mentioned the the duties of the heart and uh, the book. Uh, the book. Where did Rambam get his Sufi influence from? Also, just in terms of timeline and like where where did he take that from? Okay, so um, Rambam was aware of Sufis within Cairo. He certainly was familiar with the, certainly, can I say certainly? I can't say certainly. Rambam was likely familiar. His son, Avraham, was certainly familiar with um, duties of the heart, which makes me think that his father was also aware of it, but I don't know that for sure. Um, so both in terms of Jewish literature and in terms of the intellectual milieu, um, by the 13th century, we will see, so right, Rambam dies at the beginning of the 13th century, but by the middle of the 13th century, Aristotelianism is on the decline and Sufi mysticism is really on the rise. So people have heard of Rumi, right? Rumi is 13th century. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a movement within Islam that um, caught on in Judaism as well, because there is nothing, um, there is nothing particular to Sufi mysticism that violates Judaism's precepts. Um, does Rambam anywhere refer to himself and his um, state of being or how close or far he is from attaining uh, this perfect knowledge? Or no, be no. Um, the closest we get is in the introduction to the Guide of the Perplexed, where he talks about these flashes of divine knowledge. And he, it's in Hebrew, we call it Torat Havrakot. Havraka, um, Barak, Barak is lightning. Havraka is, I'm forgetting the word in English. Shining. Not the word I'm looking for. I'm sure you are right, Shirel. A Havraka is a, a um, an epiphany, okay? Like these epiphanies, these, you know, like momentary um, vistas of comprehension. So scholars suggest that he wouldn't be able to talk about those kinds of momentary flashes of insight unless he had himself attained them. So Torata Havrakot and this kind of um, epiphany, but you know, the, the epiphanies are fleeting. So many scholars, including Heschel, uh, Heschel wrote a biography of Maimonides, um, understands Maimonides to be at that level. Um, I think the rest of the questions are more about acceptance, so we'll keep them uh, for Got it. later. Okay, so let's now introduce um, Avraham Maimuni. So, Avraham ben Maimon, um, Av Avraham ben Moshe. So look at his dates, 1186. Rambam was born in 1138, kind of an old dad. And this was his only son to, to survive, right, to make it. Apparently he had a daughter who, was, um, who died early on. So he has one son, and he doesn't have the son until he's 48 years old. And, you know, he lives a good long life, but he dies when the son is 18 years old. So that gives you an idea of how much would be possible to impart to your son before you die, right? So, you know, he had five, seven, eight years of really mature learning. I mean, you know, I don't know, really mature at 10 years old, but, but that's all he had. So when Rambam died... Avraham was recognized by the community as a, a prodigy, as, a, as an Ilui. Um, he took over for his dad the position of Nagid, became a, a medical doctor like his dad, and became a Sufi. And he was really explicit about it. Um, he claimed that the patriarchs, the biblical patriarchs and the prophets, had also been Sufis, but that the traditions became lost within Israel. And so he's bringing them back. And as I, as I say here, right, Sufism is on the rise and Aristotelian is on the decline. Okay. Avraham, what his mission is, what his agenda is, 
is to dial his dad's radicalness back. So he wants to reconcile his dad's more radical ideas with more mainstream Jewish philosophy and mysticism, as well as Sufism. When his dad dies, he takes on, as a teacher, the head of the pietistic circle in Cairo, Avraham Hechassid. Okay. I point out that both Avraham as an Aristotelian and, sorry, that Rambam Moshe Ben Maimon as an Aristotelian and his son Avraham were ascetic. They believed that the pleasures of the body took you away from the knowledge of the soul. Okay. So here's what Abraham espoused. He agreed with his father to a point. Rationalism prepares you for divine contemplation. But if you only have that level of rationalism and knowledge and science, that's not enough. That's not the goal. What Abraham emphasizes over and over again is the experiential dimension of the divine encounter, not the intellectual dimension. So for Rambam, seeing the divine presence is totally metaphorical. It's about understanding. It's about knowledge. But for Abraham, there's actually a sensory component of seeing and experiencing God's created light. It's real in the external world. Moses, Rambam, didn't believe that all of Israel heard the Decalogue at Mount Sinai. Remember that? But Abraham did believe that. It's a huge difference. When God tells Moses to have the people prepare themselves for revelation in Exodus chapter 19, prepare yourself for the third day, Abraham understands that what they needed to do was to prepare themselves intellectually for that moment of revelation. And here is Abraham in his own words. There are two forms of solitude that most distinguish the elevated path. This is the way of the great friends of God. That's code for the pietists. That's code for the Sufis. And through it, the prophets attain or arrive. Through this kind of solitude, the prophets attain or arrive at the goal. It's divided into external solitude and internal solitude. But the aim of the external is internal, which is the ultimate rung of the ladder of attainment. Nay, it is attainment. Inner solitude, attaining inner solitude is the goal. Let us then say, in reference to that internal solitude, which is complete sincerity of the heart, to which David prayed in the Psalms, create for me a lev tahor, a pure heart, and which Asaf attained, also from the Psalms, my flesh and my heart fail, but the rock of my heart and my portion is God that it consists of emptying the heart and the mind of everything except God, may he be exalted, and of their being filled with, these are the people, the prophets, they're being filled with and inhabited by God. That's not divine transcendence. That's divine imminence. That's God in your kishkas. Maimonides did not believe in God in your kishkas. Maimonides believed that God was wholly other, completely transcendent. There is nothing that we can know about God. We can only learn about God through God's actions. Abraham, his son, rejected that. And this is a great description of mysticism. You know where it shows up again, the next time it shows up again? In Hasidism, in the 18th century. And it's called Bitul Yesh nullification of your own ego, right? Art Green says that after you nullify your ego, what you find left is the divine presence. Okay. 
now I'm wrapping things up for the whole kit and caboodle. Okay. When Moses said that silent meditation was that, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not there yet. This is still the fourth section, fourth session. When Moses said silent meditation was the highest form of worship, he would be engaged in silent meditation on God through knowledge of God's actions. His goal is intellectual, not experiential. For Abraham, there is a sensory light which illuminates, envelops, and penetrates the worshiper. For Abraham, philosophy, and not just for Abraham, this is part of the Maimonidean controversy in the 1230s in France. For Abraham, philosophy can be dangerous and should only be reserved for the intellectually mature. Okay. This is wrapping things up. According to Joseph Ibn Kaspi, Rombaum's descendants stopped studying philosophy. Could be true, could be not true. We don't have any, we don't have any corroborating evidence. The evidence that we have is that Avraham identified himself as a Sufi, and the last link in the chain of the Maimonidean family was a guy named David ben Yehoshua. That to me says something. There's no Moses. You would think if you were a descendant of Moses ben Maimon, that you would be either Moses ben Joshua or David ben Moses. That's what I would think. But it's David ben Yoshua. The last known descendant, he immigrated to Syria and built a library there com combining Jewish and Sufi texts. And then we lose track of the family. So why is he the biggest loser? Because if you... Think about what Rambam wanted to do in writing the Mishnah Torah. This is the last halachic code book you'll ever need. Now go do something important with your life and study Aristotle, right? That was a complete and total failure. If you think about the way Maimonides thought about God as totally transcendent, we pretty much reject that exclusively transcendent. If you think about how open Maimonides was to outside wisdom, to Aristotle, to Sufism, to understanding God through creation and through science, oh my God, look in a yeshiva. It is so depressing how scientifically illiterate people who claim Rambam as their hero are. It is so depressing. Um, the idea of providence, the idea of reward and punishment, right? I'm not saying, by the way, I want to be really clear that I agree with Maimonides on all these things. I'm presenting Maimonides as a teacher and he is the greatest loser, right? He rejects reward and punishment. Not everything happens for a reason. That's part of some divine plan. Um, good things don't happen to good people. Bad things don't happen to bad people. It's all a noble lie, right? That's still part and parcel for many people's Judaism. Um, and the final thing that I really feel like Rambam failed on is this idea of reading the Bible and reading Jewish literature as literature. What we hear so often is kakatuv, right? That's what's written. Okay, that's what's written. It doesn't mean we can't interpret it figuratively. So in so many, not in all ways, right? Maimonides did succeed in disabusing his, not his generation, but disabusing future generations of the idea that God has a body. Right, We no longer think God has a body. I would say that's kind of general Judaism 101. And people, up until Maimonides, people thought God had a body. So people still think of God in human terms. He didn't get rid of all anthropomorphism or anthropopathism when we um, ascribe to God human emotions and human traits. But the, the kind of corporeality that had been associated with many members of the Jewish community in their understanding of God, um, 
I think he largely uh, eliminated. I'm going to take questions in just a second, but we very, not frequently enough do we teach Rambam with mysticism. So this is my one attempt to bring them into conversation with another. The mystics believed that Rambam was 100% right, but just not about 100%. The mystics, the Kabbalists, they took Rambam's God and they say, yes, you're right, you're right, you're right. And that God is Ein Sof, is the limitless, infinite, infinite, indescribable, ineffable God that the Kabbalists say is completely transcendent. But Rambam, what you're missing is the other aspect of God. The other aspect of God is that which somehow relates to us, which somehow relates to human action, to human psychology. It somehow influences the dynamic, and that's the word I wanna point out. It somehow influences the dynamic of our world. Kabbalah, if you think about the spherot, my teacher Art Green calls those 10 little circles a dynamic unity because they're always being activated in different places and they're always switching and they're always, they're always moving around. Aristotle was not big into movement. Aristotle was about eternal sameness. So for, for Aristotle, the way things are, are the way things have always been, are the way things will always be. That's not Judaism. That's not Greek. Uh, sorry, that's not Judaism. That's Greek. So in a way, although Maimonides' own kids left and moved away from the idea of Aristotelian rationalism, it was preserved on the periphery of Jewish mysticism for the next several hundred years within this sphere of Ein Sof, of that part of God that is incommunicable. And that then disappears with modernity because Hasidism turns this description of God into a description of religious psychology. And so we're no longer talking about metaphysics. We're talking about devotional posture. And that's what Hasidism does. And the Mishnagdim say, you know, we shouldn't deal with any of that anyway. Yes, Kabbalah is true, but since we can't influence anything, since we can't understand anything, let's just study Torah. So what's been really interesting to see is how Rambam has come back in certain of his previous failures amongst New Age Jews, and academics. And with that, I will stop sharing and take your questions. So um, we have time for a couple of questions. Um, can you say, like, do we know why this happened? Why did his son go far away from him? How did it, how was there such a cut from what, is there any context or historical context for that shift? Not that, not that I know of, and I don't think that we know of. Um, what I can say is that, you know, Rambam doesn't give you a warm, fuzzy God. And if you're looking for a warm, fuzzy God and a warm, fuzzy um, religion to rely on, you know, look elsewhere. Um, is there a distinctive difference in the way he's accepted between communities, say Ashkenazi and Mizrahi or ultra-Orthodox, modern Orthodox? Is there a distinction there? Um, not that I know of, the distinction is between the kind of academic community and the observant community. So the observant community's Rambam is the Rambam of the Mishnah Torah. And the academic community's Maimonides is the Maimonides of the Guide of the Perplexed, in general, in general. Um, you mentioned uh, when you talked about the mind and heart that for uh, the Rambam it's the same thing and then with Avraham Maimani and you mentioned the soul so what is that the heart the mind does he look at it differently no it's all part of it they're all different words for the for the intellect but for Avraham no so they're not quite the same for Avraham the soul incorporates the intellect but 
is not exhausted by the intellect. There is more to the soul than just the intellect. Okay. Um, and are there, were there any communications between Avra Maimoni and any of the Rambam's intellectual heirs? Like, is there... Um... No, I don't know that we have any evidence of correspondence. So when you think about um, people in the Maimonidean tradition, um, you don't think of Cairo. You think of Gersonides um, in... Uh, in what is today France. Um, you think of other philosophers, even Crescus in Spain, uh, Joseph Albo after Crescus. So later and not in Egypt. Hey, um, so I will say there's one last question here of how, how can we get more of Rob Sherry? So um, if people want to listen, <laughs> listen more, uh, and hear you in other places. I'll obviously send your website and books in the uh, follow-up notes, but is there something coming up that people can uh, join into? Or Our fearless leader, Ari Katz, and I are currently in discussion. Perfect. Amazing. Um, I will also just say, because we need to end, but there were many questions about uh, Sufism, and I'll make sure to include in the follow-up notes so that those of you who are interested can dive in and explore that world too. Yeah, um, Russ, Russ Fishbane and Paul Fenton are two of the real, you know, superior scholars on the relationship between Judaism and Sufism. Okay. So you'll be receiving all of that. Uh, and one last thing, the image you showed by David Friedman, is yeah. that the, okay, that's the artist, just so we give credit and I'll send also that in the follow-up notes. So uh, Rav Shai, thank you so, so much for this incredible four-part series journey, deep dive into uh, the Rambam's world. Um, and uh, I think I say this for everyone. We look forward to seeing you on other, uh, on more CSP programs. Uh, thank you very, very much. It'll be a pleasure. It was great learning with you all. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a lovely day, afternoon, evening, or night, wherever you are. And we'll see you in upcoming programs. Bye.